Hi, it's Peter Chapman from SKU Food, and I want to welcome you to another edition of our SKU Food Recipes for Success, which are presented by FCC. And it's a treat to welcome Danny Duguay to, to our Recipe for Success. So uh, welcome, Danny. Great to see you there. Hello. And I will give you the formal introduction in a few minutes, but uh, it's really great to have you here. And uh, as we continue our series in July on telling your story, and uh, we started out with the uh, a couple of sessions of just talking about, um, you know, how to tell your story properly. And, and we gave you some, some templates that you can use and, and how to start with that target market. And really so important for food producers and processors to have a great understanding of the target market. And when, if I was to talk to you, that would be one of the first questions that I would ask you. And then we talked about needs and how your customers and consumers have different needs and how to focus on them. We talked about turning features into benefits and then how to tell your story. So we've covered a lot of ground in our sessions in July. And uh, I'm really excited that this week we have Danny here because we're gonna talk about how to tell that story so effectively and working with an influencer to do it. So, so we wanna thank everybody for being here. And uh, our SKU Food Recipes for Success uh, are meant to be interactive. So uh, we do want you to ask questions. So if you wanna use the Q&A at the bottom, you can type that in and I'll keep an eye on it. And uh, I know Danny can answer whatever you've got to throw at her. She's uh, more than capable of, of handling those questions. So we look forward to, to getting some questions throughout the session today. And uh, a little bit about SKU Food. We're an online community where we work with different food producers and processors and really try to help producers and processors get their products on the shelf and into the shopping cart. And I use my background, which is too many years probably in this business working uh, starting at a store and working my way up through law blah companies and then having the privilege of working with different producers and processors from coast to coast for the last uh, 12 years and when we're allowed to travel again speaking at events and and talking to people about how to get their products into the stores and, and be successful with them so that's really what we try to do at skew food and, and one of the great things about our recipes for success is the partnership that we have with fcc and uh, it's been it's been great and for i'm sure many of you are familiar with fcc and that their background really starting in the agriculture side of the food industry but now they're really uh changing how they are going to the market and, and really working with the entire value chain in the food industry and they're the only canadian lender that would be 100 percent invested in agriculture and, and canadian food you've been working in the food industry for over 20 years here in the in the halifax area and you're the sole proprietor for Caper and Olive Catering. Uh, you're also uh, part owner and operator of Harvest, which is a farm to table eatery. And then you also do, I don't know how you do all this stuff, but we look forward to hearing about it. Uh, curated dining experiences, in-home private chef services, food photography, and recipe development. And I, I think that's, I said to Danny earlier, we, she's got a lot of balls that she's juggling in the air, but congratulations for, for all those things. And I know that you do a lot of work with clients to help them get their products noticed through social media and using them, you know, often in what you're doing every day. So uh, we can't wait to hear about all the different things going on. Is there anything I missed in all that? I mean, I don't think so. It's pretty much a laundry list more than a resume at this point, isn't it? It but, is. Uh, yeah, a lot of different pots, but they're all good pots to have my hands in. Right, yeah, well, and I think, uh, it's important, the food industry is so complex and there's so many different parts to it. And, and you, you know, it's, it's hard to just be in one segment of it. So, uh, so I think it's great what you're doing and uh, which, where did you start? What was the first thing that you started working on? Like that I'm still working on now or as far as my career? Well, where did the career start? Yeah, so I've been cooking my entire life, quite literally. It's all I've ever wanted to do is cook. Um, and so I'm actually from Ontario. I've been in Halifax for seven years now. Um, okay. But I originally studied to be a pastry chef at George Brown College in Toronto. Okay. And then that sort of led me into the catering field, which led me to be more interested in the savory side of things. And um, then when I moved here, I worked as executive chef for a while uh, for one of the big catering firms here. And then I uh, you know, it's six years that I've been doing my personal chef business um, and about three years doing influencing work. Mm, awesome. Awesome. Well, and it's uh, people's careers in the food industry are so interesting because they take different twists and turns and mine is more on the retail side, but it's, 
it's just always interesting and and i think one thing builds on the other and you always rely on that experience that you have to take that next step right so yeah it can be quite transient for a lot of people in this field that just move and shift and i think that's often because we're creative minds and we need something to re you know ignite that spark again sometimes so yeah mm -hmm. it's quite common <laughs> right and then the last uh, five months have been something that none of us had ever sort of planned for and uh, and that's part of the reason we started doing our recipes for success was a chance to try to give back to people in the industry and share some insights and try to help them in their business and how has it affected what you've been working on well honestly in the beginning if you would ask me that question you know two months in i was uh, pretty distraught about the whole thing because i do have like you've pointed out so many different avenues and revenue streams that i work on and it was as if all of those shut down all at one time um, but out of this experience, I was offered the role to come on as part owner of Harvest and I wouldn't have normally been allowed or able to do that with my schedule as it was. So, mm -hmm. I mean, opportunities arose for sure from that. And so it's all bright and cheery and happy now, <laughs> you know, come back into some form of normalcy. It, yeah, it's definitely coming around. So, yeah, I think a lot of us who, especially people self-employed, when this whole thing started to happen, a lot of us looked and said, wow, what does this mean to us? And uh, and, and it uh, means different things to so many different people, but, uh, but you do have to keep going and, and find the opportunities in it. And uh, part of actually what we're going to talk about in August with our recipes for success, we're actually going to take two weeks off. I'm going to take the first two weeks of August and we're going to take a break. This is our 19th edition of, of this, uh, doing these sessions Wednesday afternoon. And so we're going to take the first two weeks of August off, but we're going to come back in, uh, on August 19th and 26th. And Susan will put the, uh, the link in the chat for people if you'd like to register. But uh, we're going to talk about how the whole change to the marketplace has impacted producers and processors, how to assess what you're doing, and how to talk to your customers about it. So that's what we're going to do on the 19th. So we're going to talk employees, we're going to talk cost of goods, and we're going to talk about communicating uh, to your customers, to the retailers. And then on the 26th, we're going to talk about how to get a price increase, because I think that there is not one producer or processor who has been through all this in the last few months who has not had an impact on their cost of goods, whether it's efficiencies in production, uh, ingredient cost changing, equipment, different. there's so many different things happening right now. So we're going to talk about the process we use to help people get through to a price increase with the retailers. So those are the, the two things we're going to do in August. So we look forward to having people uh, join us and, uh, and really dive into some of those things. So Danny, one thing I wanted to do is just ask our, the people who are with us today, just how many people are working with an influencer. So I'm just going to launch that poll now. And if people, uh, want to just take a second and uh, I gave you a few choices there that either you are working with an influencer or you're not or you would like to and then also we often we have a number of people here who work in different support roles to the industry whether it's in government or industry associations so uh, I, I think it's it's always interesting to understand who we're talking to and and um, and what their sort of background and I'm not seeing a lot of people who are working with influencers yet so uh, so that's interesting. So I think there are a lot of people here today who want to learn about that. So, so, uh, but that's a good thing. It's, uh, I'm to the right place. <laughs> that's right. They are at the right place. So, um, so we'll just look for another couple of minutes and then I'll close it off. But uh, we appreciate you sharing where you're at right now. Um, so I can see right now that it's about a third of the people said, no, they're not. A third of the people said, no, they'd like to. And then the rest is either supporting industry or um, they, less than 10% are actually working with an influencer. So, um, so I can put that up just for a second so people can see it. But uh, you can see that not too many people are. So I think it's a big opportunity from uh, the market space um, for, uh, for people who are influencers such as yourself. So, so maybe just talk a little bit, Danny, about um, all these different things that you've worked on and how you see that that positions you well to to do the influencing work that you do in your not in your spare time but as part of all those things that you're working on yeah so I definitely count it as like a tertiary part of my sort of like revenue and my what I do for a living um, I think I'm positioned well to do what I'm doing because 
A, I think anytime somebody's really passionate about something, it gives them a better ability to speak about something or to present a product well, because they're going to do so from a passionate point of view. Um, but also my experience, you know, I've worked in so many different facets. I've worked with companies, um, you know, helping them get positioned better um, or, you know, for even for my own company, I'm constantly developing recipes for clients with dietary needs and, and or for caterings that are curated specifically to a client. Um, and so I bring all of that knowledge and experience and passion to the table when I'm uh, working with companies uh, in the influencing space. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and for me, it's, uh, it's always interesting to to understand how'd you get into doing some of the influencer work because it's not, you know, you need a following and, and you need to, to have that community somewhat built. I'm sure it continues to build, but um, how did you get into doing it? So it actually kind of fell in my lap or happened by accident per se, but um, I am extremely tech illiterate. I don't know how to work most software and computers well. And so I wasn't in a position to have a website for my personal company and decided I'd open an Instagram account and just start showing some photos from my phone about, you know, the food that I was taking at caterings or what have you. And I started to build a following from there and it was all very organic. And then I started having some local companies reach out to me or me to them and we would trade product for, uh, you know, some photography work or recipe development, and it just kind of snowballed from there. It's three years later, and I have 11,000 and something followers now. Um, almost all of them are from Nova Scotia, primarily Halifax, um, and mm -hmm. sort of with the same demographic that I am. Um, and yeah, it just, I never meant to get to this space, but I, I, I really enjoy that I'm here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's been a fun ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. And, I, and I'm sure that the work all does sort of tie in, right? When you're doing some of the influencer work and you may be developing a recipe for one of the products and then you can use it in some of your other work as well, right? A lot of the times I'll say to a client, hey, you know, that I cook for four on a regular basis. Hey, I just came up with this recipe for such and such company and I think you'd really like it. Do you want me to throw it on your menu? And they're like, sure, I'll try it. So it, it actually is convenient for me because efficiency first and foremost, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, see, I can see that now. You're charging people double now. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about finding an influencer. So if, if we're thinking about uh, food producers and processors, um so so where do they start how do they how do they start finding somebody to to sort of be part of their marketing strategy in this regard so i think i mean a lot of my experience that i'm going to speak in regards to is going to be instagram related i don't do a lot of uh use a lot of other uh you know i don't have a blog and I don't really use, utilize Facebook that much, but just speaking from Instagram, which I feel is the number one tool in the food and beverage industry, just because it really is a sort of a dilution of content down to just a really perfectly curated piece of art, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in those spaces, one of the first things you can do is look for things like geotags. So if I'm working with a company that's local to Halifax and I post their product, I'm going to geotag it to be from Halifax, Nova Scotia. So if you were to go on there and search for Halifax or whatever area you're looking to, you know, your products from or you're, you're looking for an influencer from, generally the ones with the top feeds will come up at the top and you'll be able to immediately have access to their, their page and see where they're from. Um, hashtags work in the same way. So if you know, a, a, product that's similar to yours and you were to search you know a hashtag for that company or even on that company's page you'll likely find some influencers who have worked with them or um, have utilized their product in a photo or maybe you're just looking for your sort of skew so maybe you're like you know your kombucha or something so you're looking for you know who's worked with kombucha as a whole um, mm -hmm. so just sort of utilizing those search functions within the app itself um would be i think one of the first places to go all right yeah and uh and, and then then there are and there's people who work in this space sort of as a, a bit of a i'll call it a go-between or intermediary right of like a between brands and influencers so marketing firms that kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah so marketing and pr firms i know of a few locally here that specifically 
work with influencers to help team them up with whatever they're so maybe they're you know into the fitness industry so they'll team them up with the their other clients uh, that are in that industry as well to work together so if mm -hmm. you go online and search you know pr firms in your area and find ones that are working with influencers they usually have a whole list of people you can work with and i mean that works both ways if you're an influencer you can reach out to pr firms and say hey do you have clients that are looking for this kind of work right sure Sure. Okay. And there are search tools as well, right? Yeah. People so can access. There's databases that are usually run by pretty large companies um, and they do a lot of the legwork for you, sort of uh, segregating everybody into what their specialty area is. So if you were looking for somebody specifically in the food industry, they'll have those people they'll, and they'll usually be able to help you categorize them by their demographic and their audience. Um, so mm -hmm. you're, you're really able to target your audience that way. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important piece of this is, is that. And, and that was sort of, so if the producer processor now has sort of done some of that initial research, then how do they go about sort of trying to, to find the right fit? Because I think that's so critical when you're working with somebody. Yeah, so I think that it's really easy to do your own sort of digging to figure out, is this person going to be the right fit for me? I think the first place to look is to read through their blog or, or scroll through their Instagram, go through their Facebook, because what they're presenting to the world is going to be a fair representation of what they're going to present and the work they're going to do for you. So uh, look for things like, you know, do they present themselves with the same morals and values that would be in line with your brand and your company? Um, do they use coloring and editing and, and these tools that are available to them that would fit within your feed? Do they seem creative and authentic? Um, you're able to answer a lot of these questions just by scrolling and, and searching through whatever it is that they've already um, published to the internet. Mm -hmm. and, and I assume that it's important to find people that are on if, if I'm using Facebook, for example, to build my community, then I've got to find an influencer who's got the right crowd there in that application. I think yes and no. I think sometimes okay. it's good to be diverse, right? So I think maybe finding one, what would be most ideal is one who specializes in your space, but maybe also utilizes some other spaces as well. Um, that can definitely be beneficial. But yeah, I think like if somebody, if, if you're primary source of marketing is something like Facebook, then for sure, you're going to want somebody who at least knows what they're doing there, but also able to offer other insight helps too. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's true, they could be missing their, uh, a big piece of their target market. Yeah. And so when you're working with somebody, would you ask them that, their definition of their target market? Would, is that something that you would be looking for when you're, when you're talking to a, a food business? I mean, a lot of the times I think by the time that they've gotten to me, they've already figured out for themselves that, but we have tools available to us. A lot of influencers will have something called a media kit, which will explain who their demographic by age, sex, location, um, and how many people are viewing their posts, all these things. They'll usually have that laid out on there, but even secondary to that, you can requesting something like somebody's insights will allow them to to share that with you but it, so yeah i think by the time most of the time by the time somebody's coming to me looking um i'll make sure we're the right fit and ask you know who they're wanting to sort of get this information to the tricky thing with social media is that i can't really change who my audience is right, right. so if they're going to need to work with and they want an all-male audience I'm just not the right fit to work with, right? So mm -hmm. I think just sure. open an conversation about that and asking for it up front will sort of help navigate that. Mm -hmm. Right, all right. And uh, now one of the things for those of us who are can be fooled easily is uh, you see some of these, you, you mentioned you have 11,000 followers on Instagram and then you, you read sometimes people have uh, 400,000 followers or something, but how do people really, understand if those are really real correct people okay. I, I know there are different things people games people play i guess we can say so there is something called buying your followers there's lots of things mm -hmm. out there where you can spend x amount of money and you can have your follower base beefed up but by a certain number um i think the number one way to suss that out is to ask for insights so look at their engagement if 
somebody has, you know, 15,000 followers and they're only getting 50 likes on a photo, something probably doesn't match up there. Um, the secondary way to do that is just to scroll through somebody's following list or look at their demographic of who's following. If, if I'm posting everything in Canada and all of my followers are from overseas, there's probably a lack of authenticity there. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a polite way of saying it, a lack of authenticity. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? It's, it can be frustrating in my space because sometimes you have people who come to the market who have got all of their followers and sometimes people don't know how to look for that and you see them getting a lot of big jobs and it's frustrating not just because obviously a loss of income for people who are maybe more deserving per se, but also because then you're like, oh, this poor company then could have worked with somebody who they really would have gotten more benefit from their dollar than this right. person who has bought their followers or however you want to put it. <laughs> right, right. No, that's true. And uh, I'm just going to check in. I'm not, I haven't seen any questions yet, but if anybody has any questions, I know we'd be happy. And it's kind of a, a place where we've talked a little bit about the uh, the work that you've got to do to to find influencers and then also the next step about trying to find that right fit. So if anybody's got any questions, we'd be happy to check them out. You can just type them into the Q&A there and uh, we will take a look at them or in the chat, one or the other, I can I can check out both. Um, so if you do go ahead and if not, I'm going to, I'm going to keep going, but I'll definitely, uh, keep an eye on, on what, uh, what we see in the chat. Um, so one of the things I find interesting and in, is that when you're trying to, uh, build or develop a relationship with some of these people, they're not the easiest people to get a hold of. And, uh, even though they make, you know, a part of their living or a good part of their living, whatever, from, uh, being representing and, and communicating um it's it's not that easy to get in touch with them so what sort of recommendations would you have for people about how they can do that and see that one's such a loaded question from because i come from a background personally of being in business and so i'm I, i'm i'm more of the like can't go to bed with an unanswered email type <laughs> mm -hmm, so i'm mm -hmm. usually response, but i have had a lot of feedback from companies i've worked with about it being really difficult to work with influencers and get a hold of them sometimes. So one thing I always suggest is, you know, you can send a quick um, direct message to somebody or a DM is what we sort of call it as its abbreviation, but you say, you know, send somebody a DM and say, you know, you're obviously going to be representing your company and you're hopefully, I would always suggest not uh, reaching out from a personal account, but from your company's account um, mm -hmm. and say, you know, we're we love your page. We're interested in working with you and just keep it really short and ask them for the best way to get a hold of them. So don't just assume that direct message is the best way because in any given day I could get 200 direct messages and it's not like email where I'm reminded that I have one that's unanswered or what have you and they can get lost in translation. So I think just a quick, what's the best way to get a hold of you? We'd love to work to get with you, uh, that kind of messaging. Um, and I mean, for me personally, email is best and oftentimes an uh, influencer will have their account listed for business and if you just click you know their little contact tab up comes their email shoot them an email and if you're really eager both you know that way one or the other one will work <laughs> Definitely. yeah oh phone's too old school at this point but yeah i think you know a facebook message or a, an instagram message and an email is yeah email is just so much easier to keep track of mm -hmm. okay and uh it, yeah, I, I found it ironic because, the, you know, in a, in a industry where people do need to communicate with people to, to keep their thing going, um, it is hard. But if you're getting 200 messages a day, that's that's a fair amount to keep track of, too. So we have to respect that. And, and it's no yeah. different than I would tell people when they're building relationships with retailers. You know, category managers are all different. you got to figure out what you know the best method of communication with them and and even what time of day sometimes because sometimes you get somebody who's a early morning riser and they're in there doing things and that's the best time and so but you do want somebody responsive too because if you're going to work with them you want to have a responsive relationship right percent yeah i think that you know just like with any working relationship if you're not getting immediately what you hope for out of working with somebody then maybe they're not the right fit to work with right yeah. but like a lot of the time with you know social media maybe i have a giveaway running or something yeah I, mean, I can just be boom boom messages coming in and i hate to to miss one you know so so yeah mm -hmm. so oftentimes going, going both routes or an email route is you might get a more sure. quick response 
Right, right. Well, and I will tell you that uh, you were one of the people who responded. So congratulations on that front. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I see there are a couple of questions. So let me um, let me just take a look. So somebody's asking, um, how are you compensated? Like so, how am I paid for? Right. So that's a question. So it depends. When I very first started out, and I was very much more. I mean, I'm still considered um, pre pretty close to a micro influencer. But um, when I, you know, had five thousand or less followers, a lot of the times I would work for product. So, um, I mean, it was advantageous to me because I have a catering business. So you give me enough quantity, I can turn that into dollars somehow myself. Or when I'm working with like, you know, a grocery store or something, I might say, hey, I have an idea for a photo shoot. Can I come in and shop for those ingredients and then turn that into a photo, which saves me some overhead. Um, but yeah, generally speaking at this point, I, I get paid for per photo or per recipe development. Um, depending and I, I, I usually do that on a per case basis but a lot of influencers will have a set pricing list that they're able to provide that's right and I think that it's the reality is that um, food and it doesn't matter different product categories that are using influencers we're talking specifically about food but it's uh, I think that you really need to think about it the same as any kind of um, promotion marketing type thing that you're doing and uh, it's no different than buying a television ad that if you buy an ad on a, um, a show that only reaches, you know, 5% of the market, then it's going to cost this much. If you find a show that's reaching 20% of the market, it's going to cost this much. And, uh, Absolutely. and, and you do, you can negotiate, but I mean, it's not like it's, uh, it's, uh, there are sort of, you can find sort of the, the boundaries of it, right? Like that, uh, yeah. if you're going to do something with somebody who has a, following just in Nova Scotia, then it, there's going to be a certain value to that. Whereas if it's national, it's a different value, right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, just not devaluing somebody's work is really important. So not making sure you're coming in too low, but there's also a really um, big advantage if you are a smaller company that doesn't have a lot of marketing dollars to reach out to influencers who have a thousand, two thousand, three thousand followers that are right in your demographic because they will generally work for products. They're just excited mm -hmm. to get the work, build their resume, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's a good point for sure. And we got another question from Todd. So this is interesting, and I, I hadn't thought about this, but I think it's interesting. So he's asking, and I, I think I'll make it kind of a broader question, but his specific question is, are you open to influence for cannabis edibles? companies or their products or are you just food so I think he's asking specifically of you but I guess yeah. that if you kind of think of a broader question do you know do a lot of influencers really sort of say okay this is the space that I want to work in and these are things that I don't do is that something that is a fair question to ask for example I mean yeah I think because I mean if you're working with an authentic influencer then yes I won't work with a company that's a product that I wouldn't normally consume or that I wouldn't normally partake in, in under normal circumstances. So for me, like a question like that, sure, because that's a part of who I am anyways, right? But there might mm -hmm. be the next, it's not part of their lifestyle, right? Maybe they don't, they don't drink or they don't consume cannabis or whatever. And I think we all go into this knowing what we will, what the parameters we'll work within. Um, but I think it never hurts to ask, right? Mm -hmm. um, scenario, just like with anything, you get, might get a no. Um, but I think you can usually scroll through. This is a tricky one, especially with cannabis, because a lot of people, you know, like myself, I'm a consumer. I don't broadcast that on my page. Uh, and just, it's only been a short while, it's been a thing, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think that that would be a tricky one to navigate whether or not, but you can always just ask somebody. It's going to be very rare you're going to get somebody who's offended by being propositioned for an opportunity. Right. And, and I think that that's really the best. And, and we're going to talk sort of, I want to ask you next sort of about the sort of that business sort of more business kind of relationship that happens between the, the food company and the influencer. But uh, I think that it's, it's so right. You just, you want to know who you're talking to and, and ask the question. Right. And, uh, and in this one here, like you say, it's relatively new, but uh, I think before long it will be more and more, um, in sort of in front of people, I guess I would say. So 
Yeah, and I mean, influencers are going to be a huge part of that, I think, because I think the more we normalize these things and we and we share it with the world, the more that it's going to be, you know, more commonplace. And so definitely, I think, and, that, and there are some influencers who work specifically in, 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 in categories like that. They just right. push products that is in that field or they just push product that's, you know, specifically related to something. Um, and that would be, that's a really good example of where hashtags will help you find those people. Right. Mm -hmm. They probably using hashtags like, 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 you know, cannabis edibles or what have you and, and, and you'll find them in, in, through that. Right. Right. Okay. So, so we've talked about uh, for people we, we've shared with them that, uh, so how to do the research a little bit. Uh, we've talked about, <laughs> you know, how to understand the person that you want to work with and how to reach out. So now, is there work that a food processor should be doing in advance of talking to them? Or is there sort of a list of things you think they should be kind of going through in their mind before they really have that sort of business conversation with the influencer? I think that depends. I think it depends on, it's definitely good to have an idea of what you want, but I don't also think that you should be totally afraid to work with the influencer to help develop a collaboration plan um so if you're a new company you're you know you know just making one or two SKUs and and you just really don't know where to start working with definitely an established influencer um could help you know net you some ideas of what would work but i think i personally like when a company comes to me with at least just a general idea of what they're looking for. Are you looking for photo content or video content? Are you looking for an ongoing collaboration or a one-time photo recipe? Um, do you have a budget set in mind? Uh, are you going to want stories and feed posts? Just like, you know, at least an idea so that I can come to you with, you know, a better, it's like with any industry, you know, like even with my catering company, sometimes people send me emails, how are you available for catering? Well, <laughs> you know, this doesn't give me <laughs> yeah. And so it can be the same thing when, an, when a company, a food company or a beverage company comes to me and says, hey, are you interested in work? Uh, you know, a little bit more boat, like meat on the bone is helpful because I want to come back with you and be as efficient as possible in my communications. So yeah, you know, just a general idea of what you're looking for is really, you know, a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes people don't always have a sense of what they, what they want, right? They just, somebody said to them, oh, you know, this is a new channel or this is a new stream of, of sort of being able to get the word out about your products. And so you, you need to be using an influencer and they may not really know exactly. So, but I think they do need to think it through and perhaps even talk to some other food producers that you see using influencers and say, you know, what did you do? How did you go about it? And it's easy to find them, right, on Instagram or, or Facebook or wherever, Pinterest, the different places where you can find it. So have a look and maybe talk to some other people too. And I think if you're really green at this, like if you really have no experience, there would be some merit in investing and in working with a PR firm who has the roster of clients and, and they even help do that, that groundwork for you. Here's your budget. Here's the roster of influencers we have. Here's what we can do with that. Um, so I think if you were really feeling like you don't have the time or commitment for the knowledge on working with an influencer, maybe for your first couple of campaigns, going that route might be good. And then after that, okay, well now you know what it's like and what to expect and what you need and what nets for the yield to results. So then you can approach it a little bit more knowledgeable the next time. Right, right. Okay. And I heard you use the word collaboration about three or four times in the last uh, five minutes. And uh, I think that's a from what I've learned and, and my experience, that's a very important approach to have if you're going to work with influencers. This is not like going to a newspaper and buying a, a space and creating your own thing and putting it in there or, or creating your 30 second television commercial or even doing your own social media post. This is, it's a different thing. So maybe you can just elaborate on that collaboration piece a bit. Yes, so I think that in this space of marketing, you are uh, with influencers generally working with creative types. So people who have photography experience or even, you know, recipe development is a very creative uh, space to be in. Um, and so we often call it a collaboration because we're meeting in the middle. So we're taking your brand and your ideas and what you want to market and we're doing it through the way that 
we like to present to the world, you know? So whether that be through the colors we use or the editing we use or the verbiage that we're uh, putting in, in with, with the picture, however it, come, it comes together, it's important that the brand, the brand and the influencer are working together to make sure that it's a fit for both of them. Because what will happen if you don't do that, one, you might lose your influencer because they, you know, we don't really want to be pigeonholed, um, but also you're going to end up with content that doesn't seem authentic. You know, if somebody came to me and said, okay, here's the, and you, you do get this a lot with the bigger, bigger brands because there's a lot more legal stuff in the background that they need to be aware of, but especially for smaller brands, you want to come across as authentic as possible. And if you're coming saying, say this, this, and this, and make it look like that, that, and that. That's what you're going to end up with, and it might not fit into that influencer's feed or the way they normally speak or the photo they normally take, and it will show. You know, you can usually see when somebody posts something where you're like, oh, it doesn't seem authentic. And to be honest, I will, I'm not going to be, you know, enticed to buy a product if I feel like this was just a transaction of money for, you know, exactly what the, the uh, brand or whatever said here do this right if somebody's coming from a standpoint where they seem like genuinely they tried the product they love the product and and then they're presenting it that way you're going to be like oh wow they really loved it and you're going to want to go buy it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so i think it's and that's it goes so much back to that fit thing too about sort of just i think that's almost i don't know how you measure that i think it's almost a a bit of a, a gut feeling that you need to have that says you know what this you know, this person is, from what I can learn about them, you know, what they would do with my product, my brand is reflective of how I would put it out there. And, and they're going to do it. If, in I, a if I could give an example here, I'm not often one to pose with products because I just feel as though it's not going to really sell it for me to be in the photo. It will sell better to have a recipe I've created and put it in there. So when I have companies approach me who are like, we only want to pay you if you're going to be in the photo. It's not a fit for me then. If I saw yeah. it as being a fit, then I'm then I might. But if that's the only option for me, then I'm probably not going to go for it because. So if you were sit thinking to yourself, I only want to work with somebody, or I only want to do photo photography work with the influencer in the photo. Find somebody's feed where they're very oftentimes in the photo with the product because then they're mm -hmm. obviously going to be yes on that, right? Yeah, I did notice that about your post. I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> um, so, so there are a couple more questions here, which I'm going to get to in a moment, but, um, we've talked about sort of the collaboration piece. We've talked about, um, you know, how, what's going to exchange for what and that kind of thing. So would you have a contract that you use with people when you're getting into these relationships? I suggest a contract, you know, what are your deliverables as the brand? What are your deliverables as the influencer? What are we getting paid for that? When is the content can be submitted by? When will it be posted? How many posts will there be? All of these things, because just like with any dealings in business, which at the end of the day, this is a business transaction, right. you want to make sure you're covering both ends and deliverables are really important on this kind of project. You don't want somebody who's going to be, you know, two weeks late or whatever and you have no onus to say hey this is when you said you were going to have it done by right you want to cover yourself because again yeah. it's business that's right and and contracts sometimes we say oh you know we don't need to use the lawyers and all that but a simple contract can make it so that it's much smoother for everybody so yeah you don't need right. to be investing thousands of dollars of legal work or anything just something you know typed up on word perfect and signed and sent mm -hmm. back or whatever will work, you know, just something mm. to have some accountability from both ends. Right. Okay. So we got a couple of questions and one of them actually, I think is going to lead into uh, some of the, the posts that you wanted to share because they're looking for some examples of some of the things that you've been doing. So, um, but the first question is around budget. Everybody wants to talk about money today. It must be, we're getting the end of the month, I guess. <laughs> So uh, the question is, uh, what kind of budget should be set for one time and extended campaigns? Okay, so definitely, I can't answer that specifically because I don't sure. know what the product is, but what I can say is you can definitely ask for a decreased price when offering extended campaigns. So if, you know, a company that I might charge $250 a photo for one time, I might, if somebody's saying, you know, over three months, I'm going to have X amount of posts from you, 
I might do it for 100 or 150 because I see the benefit to that as opposed to the, the one and done. Um, so you, you, I would say per photo, your budget's going to be higher if you're just doing one and it can be a little bit lower, but that is going to be absolutely a per case basis, especially because influencers who don't have expertise in a field that are really just influencing because that's what where they've ended up they're going to charge based on their number of followers and what other companies pay them that's pretty much it when you come to somebody like me i'm also basing it on the expertise i bring to the table all these things so there's so many variables when you're getting into this space as far as budget goes mm -hmm. and i think that it's something that people have to ask the question when you're trying to figure out how who to work with and it's something that you need to ask and start to get a range and understand what it is to work with different people. And, and then you have to assign the value to it, right? Is that what's the best return for the investment? So Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if so you how are, up, you're not feeling comfortable with what that influencer is offering for that budget, then there's, you know, the fish, the sea is a plet is full of fish. So I'll be honest on that. You know, it's not that, anybody can open an Instagram account and start doing this and become successful at it. And so if you're not feeling like, you know, you're going to get what you wanted to yield out of, you know, your budget dollars, maybe go to somebody with a few less followers or something that maybe even has a better demographic or something, um, you know, play around with it. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, so Howard's asking about looking at some examples of what you've done. So uh, perhaps I'll share my screen. And uh, there is another question there uh, from Heather just about how you measure results, but we can come back to that one in a moment. So let me just uh, uh, put some of those examples up and, uh, and then we can have a look at it. And actually, I'll let you talk pick, about them. Yeah, for Met, for, I'm just going to point out one thing to answer the measuring results. So um, you'll see this little uh, underneath the photo on the right hand side, there's a thing that says view insights. So I'm actually able to, when I'm on my page, bring that up and it will show me how many likes, comments, saves, shares, everything the photo got, how many people saw the photo, all these things. So as far as results specifically to the, the photo and how much traffic it, market, um, it brought in and everything, that was what you would ask for from an influencer. So you would usually say, you know, I want to see the analytics or the insights to your campaign once it's done. And they're able to just take a screenshot of that information and send it your way. Um, as far as actual, um, you know, how much product did we, did I sell as a result? That's really hard to track. One thing I usually suggest for people working with influencers is to do something like a, a coupon code or something. So, you know, maybe for two weeks you get 10% off when ordering such product. Um, that's a really good way because it gives the influencer a unique code. So every time that sales process using that code, you're going to be able to see if it, if it was done through that influencer. Um, so yeah, there's lots of ways that you can do that. But as far as tracking, okay, how many, you know, cans of pop did I sell from working with this influencer? Probably not something that's super easy to figure out um, as far as I know on my end. Um, so let, I can, this photo here was done for Good More Kombucha. So they're a local company to, um, they're in Dartmouth. Um, so local to Nova Scotia. And I worked with them on quite a few campaigns. Um, we also have done things like giveaways and things together. Um, so this was a cocktail recipe my partner and I created for them. And you'll even see, see it says plus a discount code, right? In my, I was going to ask you about so, that. So that's what yeah, you're talking about, right? It's a great example. So not only did I do a photo for them, I also did a recipe. I also offered them a discount code on my website. So then they were able to track how many people ordered, you know, a six pack delivered to their door as a result of this campaign. Right. And the delivered to the door, that was during the whole pandemic thing. So people, so in That's terms of <laughs> sort of being, being responsive and uh, trying to, you know, deal with a situation that's going on right now. Right. Exactly. And so this was done specifically to market that they were doing that. And uh, mm -hmm. Goodmore is just a great example of a company that was extremely proactive and started reaching out to influencers like me from the get go. And uh, a lot of the times these companies that I build good rapport with, I will work with them for lesser price and more product. So kombucha, for example, it's something I, I like to drink regularly. It's also a high cost uh, for retail. So I'm happy often to take, you know, a couple dozen kombucha and then a smaller price rate to, to do something like this for them. Mm, okay, interesting. All right, so I'm going to show the next one now. 
Yep. So this, I included this one because I just wanted to show like the diversity of the brands we can work with. My personal preference is to work with smaller companies who are local because that's just how I live my life anyways and the companies that I would deal with ordinarily. Um, but I have done some larger campaigns um, sort of mixed in in the last little while especially. So this was one that I worked with with Cocker and Gamble for Dawn Dish Spray um, that actually I was able to, by working with them a little bit on what their deliverables were, able to uh, um, incorporate it better into my feed to sort of match as opposed to, um, if I could give an example, I worked with 3M late, uh, recently on a campaign for post-it notes and they specifically wanted a video and I don't often do video work. I've actually, I don't think ever posted a video prior to my feed. And I budged on that and went ahead and did the video and it had one of the lowest um, engagement rates that I've ever had because I think it just wasn't a fit to my feet. Um, so I think sometimes working with your influencer when they say, you know what would be a better fit for my feet is this, is being a little bit flexible on that. So this one I asked them to make it so that I could have it look like a lot of my flat lays that are already on my page. Hmm. Okay, interesting. So this one was for um, AC Colbert's, the uh, Father's Day seafood box that they were offering. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I did a, a discount code for this one. We launched it about three days before Father's Day so that it was right on people's mind, you know, last minute ordering. Um, I did a recipe for them as well as some photos. Um, and, and yeah, this was a great campaign. Mm -hmm. okay. So Made With Local, they're another company from Dartmouth. I worked with them on many, many projects. Sheena was actually one of the first companies I started working with. And now almost every time she goes through a rebranding or offers a new product, she reaches out to me because we've established this relationship um, through social media. And so now we just work together on all these projects. But um, this is just a different example of like doing more of a general product. So rather than a recipe, um, there are some recipes in the shot, uh, but they were tied in on other posts. So sometimes when a smaller company reaches out to me that has a lesser budget, I'll talk them into, you know, we can do something like take those three recipes I already did for you, add them into a shot, and I'll charge you a little less because the legwork's, you know, already there. So kind of like right. bundle deal work on together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So actually, I think that you had, uh, did you have Neil? Who, who came on a couple weeks we ago? We did have, yeah. Neil was on talking about how to work with influencers. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, he's from This Is Marketing and they work directly with Super Creep Puree. And that's how I actually landed this gig. And again, a prime example of a local company to Nova Scotia that I established a relationship with. And now, you know, they just had offered this new product in their, in their SKUs and it was, you know, reached out to me directly right away because we, we already, they already knew exactly what I was going to bring to the table. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've worked with them on a lot of different projects as well now. And that's sort of recurring in my feed. You'll see a lot of the same companies and it's not because they're the only ones I can land. It's because they're ones I genuinely really like and because mm -hmm. we've really worked hard to have a working relationship together. And it's so nice to work with companies that you, you feel comfortable with. Sure. Cabbage Patch Kimchi. Yes, and actually, Good More Kombucha and Made With Local and Cabbage Patch Kimchi, we carry all of those products at the restaurant Harvest that I'm part owner of because of those established relationships. So when we were opening our doors at Harvest, I was like, I have these companies I love and I want to carry because we are a farm to table concept. So it worked perfectly. So sometimes when you establish these, these uh, connections, they can benefit you down the road, especially when you're working with somebody in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, this is just an, ex uh, an example. You can, instead of having a recipe sometimes, sometimes it can be more of a product shot. So this is a flat lay with all the ingredients that go into kimchi. Right. Then Napa cabbage. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And so this is one that I did with the Wolfville Farmers Market to Go uh, program. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, just showing you an example of how sometimes it doesn't have to be a single SKU or even a single company. This is multiple different companies in one shot that happen to just sell under an umbrella. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, I think that's the la last one yeah, that we had. Again, just that's luck fit. So just showing that, you know, there can be diversity with influencers. I work with beverage and with food uh, and with product. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. And I see there is one question there from Crystal, and I've got one last sort of thing that I want to ask you, which is about, um, so maybe I'll ask you first is, so developing that win-win, and that's really what this is all about. What do you see as being sort of the critical points of that win-win relationship between the food business and the influencer? Um, definitely uh, delivering on your deliverables. So, you know, paying people on time is a huge one. Um, you know, if you say that you're going to post uh, on August 31st at such and such time, making sure that you do that. Um, I think having open communication with one another and being flexible to one another's needs is important. Um, you know, some companies that I work with, they want to be like directly in tandem with me. No problem. You know, like they want to even actually be like live on shooting on certain things and stuff. And that's something that can definitely be done. Other companies want to take a much more background approach. Um, but I think still when an influencer is asking you questions or sending you examples of what they've been working on, just having an open dialogue um, and making them feel like you have their back just as much as they're having yours is important. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if I can summarize then, so that win-win relationship, it's so much about communication back mm -hmm. and forth and making sure you know what each other is doing, uh, that both people uh, meet their their deliverables that you know what you're going to do when and, and they know what they're going to do when and uh, and then also um, looking for a longer term relationship too right that uh, that you can both be a part of oh yeah so if you um reach out to a, an influencer and you work with them and they did deliver on their deliverables and you were happy with your experience just as much as it's important to show diversity with the people that you work with and how you market your product returning to somebody that you've worked with before you know if you if you put an, uh, an ad in the paper and that paper did really well you go back and, and put it back in that same paper right so you should still be going back to the employee that's the biggest thank you just with any business you know mm -hmm. to come to, uh, to be a, a repeat customer is, is, you know, obviously a really great way to maintain that relationship. Right. Okay. And uh, so one question here from Crystal is that when you're looking at your insights, um, are you looking at it from the perspective of, am I hitting my target or from the perspective of like, who am I missing or that they didn't get it? Both. Absolutely both. Yeah. So I'm often even, I also use some outside sources for analytics. So I have um, one that will even show me how many people went to that and then unfollowed me and I can actually see who's unfollowing me. So why did, why did I miss the mark with that post? What was it that maybe was different from my regular post that made people leave or disinterested? Um, and a lot of the times uh, companies won't suggest targets to me. I don't know if maybe that's unique to me or not, but usually we just want to have the best results we possibly can, but without a specific target in mind. Um, and my targets are generally just to keep things in line and growing with where I'm at. So, you know, if, if I get 250 likes on most of my posts, I want to get 250 or more. Um, so yeah, I'm utilizing it definitely for both of those things, 100%. Okay, all right. And uh, so there's, there's just one last question. Well, I see a comment from Crystal that she's going to be in Halifax next week. So she's going to come by Harvest. So uh, oh. Crystal is from <laughs> Newfoundland. So she'll uh, have a stop in and uh, maybe say hi. And uh, Norm's back on the money train here. Um, so he's asking, what kind of budget do you suggest for an impactful geolocated Instagram influencer campaign to support a new product or distribution. So he's trying to put you on the spot and say. <laughs> I mean, again, I can't speak to all influencers, but usually if somebody's sure. coming to me personally with something like that and they want to have multiple posts over multiple weeks with stories and with uh, um, post content and, 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 you know, have all these different avenues and maybe some's recipes and some's product. I, I, I usually like to have at least a couple thousand dollars presented to me because it's going to be a lot of work and I can offer them a bundled deal, but it has to also make sense for me personally. Um, and again, that can go back to what is your product though? Is it something that's beneficial to me? Because again, then maybe that budget changes and I say, you know, I'll take a few pallets or skids or whatever of your product sure. off of you. Yeah. Whatever so. maybe and however big the campaign is. So. so that's a good starting point and then it can go from there. So yeah. yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just share some of the, the good news things that we see going on 
out there in the industry. And uh, the first one, which I'll ask Danny to talk about, is her restaurant in, uh, in Bedford. So maybe tell us what you're up to and uh, where people can find you. Cool. So we are at 936 Bedford Highway, which is just at the end of Hammond Plains Road and where Bedford Highway meets it. Um, we opened our doors on July 1st. Um, we are working towards a sustainable business model in the restaurant environment space. So um, we have eat-in and take-out. Um, what's sort of proprietary most and first and foremost for Harvest is that we have a recycled shipping container directly on site with a vertical farming system that will grow a large portions of our greens and herbs hydroponically, which will help reduce our footprint. Um, we're also working towards delivery and catering. We're licensed now and going to be serving alcohol as of August 1st, but the menu primarily consists of fresh, clean food, a lot of plant-based food. Uh, we're a really great space if you have dietary needs, and it's a lot of salads, power bowls, sandwiches, smoothies, and we also have an ex a really, really great coffee program. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to go and uh, check it out. <laughs> I will have to do that. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, also one of the things which we talk about sort of in the good news section is just how people are changing their model. And so this is an example from uh, the Middle Spoon, which is another uh, food service place here in Halifax, who are now doing uh, pre-mixed cocktails that they will deliver to people. So this is something where they're selling it online and they want people to make a commitment ahead of time and um, <clears throat> then they will deliver them to you. So. It's just, I guess, examples of where people are really looking at their business model and saying, how do we keep uh, delivering in a, in a challenging time? And how do we get creative about doing some different things? So, so an example of that. And uh, I also wanted to share, this was a post I found on, on LinkedIn from uh, Pina. And uh, <clears throat> Pina's business is in uh, Manitoba. And uh, she does cookies. Uh, which are sort of a gourmet Italian cookie. Um, and what, what I the reason I wanted to share this one was that a few weeks ago, we had Brent Martell talking about social media and about how important it is to use LinkedIn to talk to your customers and to, to send a message to your retailers. So this is not so much a post about selling cookies to consumers, but what she's doing is saying, you know, just how their business has changed and evolved during the pandemic and that they're looking at selling and sales differently. So I think it's just important to remember that you want to be sending some of those messages to your customers and LinkedIn is a great platform to do it because that's where the, a lot of those people are, are connected with you. So it was an example of that. And the last one I wanted to share uh, was with, so this came from uh, IGD Research, which is something that uh, I follow and I get a lot of really interesting information about the retail space from IGD. And they had a little piece about Hershey in there today. And uh, when you think about it, <clears throat> they're looking to Halloween now. And they're saying, which is a huge part of their sales, and they're saying, how are we going to manage Halloween in the middle of this pandemic? So what they're doing is really starting to promote more to consumers to say um, self-treating. So they're thinking they're gonna be less kids going out to trick or treat because people aren't gonna want their kids kind of going up to all these different doors everywhere. So they're gonna try to promote to people to get them to do more things within their home and try to get their kids to, you know, get them to buy some of these products to do with their kids or, or a very close knit group of kids as opposed to sort of the general trick or treating. They've also changed some of their packaging to less Halloween focus and a little bit more generic. So they're looking and saying, well, if we do a little bit less at Halloween, we're not going to have to, you know, give the retailers a rebate on that product or anything because it's product they can continue to sell after Halloween. So they're being proactive on that front. And then they're also working with their retail partners on store execution and saying, how can we together deliver a uh, display and, and promotional things that are going to sell products. So I think it's, it's just an example of how a big company is really trying to look forward in this and say, what's the environment going to look like and what do I need to do to respond and react? So, so just uh, an example. And I think I just always would encourage people to, uh, to try to be proactive and, and, and think ahead. So we all have to do it no matter whether we're big or small in the middle of this. So, so Danny, I want to say thank you so much for being here with us today. I learned so much about working with influencers and, 
I uh, really appreciate all your insights. I know we got lots of great questions. I'm just going to take one more look and see um, if there is anything here. And uh, no, I think there was one about where harvest is, but you answered that when you were talking about it. So I think we got all the questions. So I uh, really appreciate you being here with us. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to checking out harvest and, and seeing you there. Perfect. Thanks so much, Pierre. It was a pleasure. All right, and I want to thank everybody for joining us, and we will see you on August 19th, and the link is still in there in the chat, and I hope everybody has been able to register so far. So thanks for being here with us, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day.